Hello, and welcome back to Not Your Inspiration, the podcast where we ramble about disability. My name is Gray, I'm the host of this shit show, and today we have a very special guest with us. So, hello, welcome to the podcast. Thank you. So, everyone, your name is Dr. Seckler. Um, You just tell people, basically, your job title. I am the Assistant Supervisor of Medical Social Services at the University of Illinois. And so I I also want to say, I know a lot of my listeners are very anti-doctors. I'm actually not a doctor. I know. It's a, it's a nice I'm not. classic. I'm a licensed clinical social worker. See? So you don't have to have any negative feelings. So... Um, This episode, I want to talk about the stigma and struggles of living with HIV, and I know you do a lot of work with patients who are HIV positive. Yes, Um, we have a network of uh, eight HIV clinics throughout uh, Chicago and surrounding area. Got it. So I want to ask, do you, so what's kind of like, the stigma of being HIV positive in 2018, and is there a stigma? Oh, the stigma is definitely still there, and it's um, also, you know, it's cultural also. I mean, so it depends what neighborhood you're in, and are you in the LGBT community? Are you in the heterosexual African American community? It's it really varies by by group, by ethnicity, by religion, um, but the stigma is definitely still there. Do you find that it's based? still on sexuality or more on class or race? Hmm, that's a good question. Um, I think that from what I see, race plays a lot. Um, Religion, I think, plays a lot. Got it. Um, Yeah, actually, I think religion is one of the biggest barriers uh, for care for a lot of people. How so? Uh, A barrier to care is, you know, not wanting others to know that you're HIV positive, right? So you're afraid to come in and seek help. So, um, uh, and people, who, some people, some religions believe that, um, a, that, uh, that same sex sex is a sin, um, mm-hmm. and, uh, not all people living with HIV are the same sex, but, um, but there is a, a greater number in, um, the gay community. Um, especially the African-American gay community between the ages of 18 and 26. That is the highest risk group right now. Um, So in their communities, the church is uh, uh, very, very important, and uh, people don't want to go against the word of their pastors. And so um, they hide their HIV status. Got it. As well as their sexual orientation. That kind of leads me into my next questions, one of which is I've heard people who are HIV positive talk about sort of the stigma between quote unquote good HIV, which maybe you get from a blood transfusion or you're born with it, and quote unquote bad HIV, which you would get from a dirty needle or sex. And I'm wondering if you see kind of that stigma amongst people who are open about their status. Um, Not within... The HIV community, we uh, call it a no-fault disease. Mm -hmm. Um, Not everybody can say they've used a condom every time they've had sex, including, I think, most of the doctors. Yeah. And, uh, you know, it's just really bad luck. Um, I know people who, uh, one woman, Vietnamese woman, who acquired HIV on her honeymoon, and she was a virgin. Wow. Um, It uh, it really is just bad luck. Of course, if you're engaging in more high-risk uh, sex or situations, you're more likely, um, you have more of a chance. But um, so I don't, I don't think within the HIV community there is. I definitely think though on the outside there is. Yeah. So my next question is, I know you work a lot with lower income, the lower income demographic in Chicago, which is a pretty big um, population. I mean, it's a big city, and of course we have a lot of um, problems in that area. My question is. Is it a class thing? Is there a a class and money barrier to getting good treatment or even just to getting the disease in general? Yes, definitely. Um, There's this myth that um, the young gay uh, African-American males, the reason the transmission is so high is because they're on the down low, blah, blah, blah. And uh, we got to stop blaming these men because 
it really is more, and we've shown this with many studies, it's, it's really the barrier to care they have um, coming from poverty and, uh, and being men of color. Uh, it's yeah, hard I would to imagine care. that that's and the trust. Very There's very lot of lack of trust um, in with the medical community. So the stigma is so great that it prevents people from getting the care that they need. Yes, a lot of them don't even want to get tested. Um, wow. They'd rather not know. What do you think people who are HIV negative can do to be good allies? Um. Uh, there is one campaign. I'm trying to remember yeah. it, Mr. Smiley. It's a, it's a, or even just it's a t-shirt. Everyday it's life. I'm positive, negative, friendly. You know, this mm-hmm. idea that um, you know, keep educating people. Um, U equals U, meaning undetectable means um, untransmittable, and we need to keep getting that word out. So here's one that I don't want to come across as mean or anything, but I'm genuinely curious. You are white and upper middle class doctor. Nope, well, I'll see SW. <laughs> <laughs> upper middle class professional. Yes. My question is, how do you get people to trust you with that stigma? And also, um, did you ever have to examine your own prejudices? Ah, yeah. Uh, I think on a daily basis, uh, everybody should be examining their own prejudices and challenging themselves. And that's part of, you know, hopefully everyone's training as a clinician working in social work. Mm-hmm. Um, what was the first part of that? <laughs> um, how how do you break into a community with so ah, much yes, stigma? Yes, yes, yes. Yeah, no, so, um, yeah, no, being white definitely was a barrier for some of working with some people with color. And um, uh, I really think initially it's a barrier and then within five minutes it's gone Mm -hmm. um if you have the ability to just connect with people and they feel that and they feel the genuine caring i mean i think i can also be someone of color and you can pick up on you know any kind of phoniness or not being authentic um i think i'm pretty authentic i can't hide my whiteness so uh so yeah it's a barrier initially but we break it down pretty quickly got it so are there this i don't mean to get dark so Mm -hmm. early in the show but um do you personally know of people who are still dying of aids in 2018 unfortunately i wish i could say i didn't but i do um at least a few a year uh personally of people that i've been uh taking care of and um they shouldn't be uh the medication could uh helps people get their viral load undetectable. That means you can't uh, detect HIV in a drop of blood. It doesn't mean that they're no longer positive, um, but they can no longer transmit HIV. Uh, The problem is, is people uh, don't take their medication. Why is that? Why don't people take those medications? Yeah, if you can answer that question, (laughs) it would be just a sought after professional in this field. But um, I think depression is one of the number one barriers. we say it's a hard pill to swallow. Uh, yeah. People have trouble accepting their diagnosis, um, fear of somebody seeing the medication, um, maybe side effects initially. Um, it's amazing to me that the stigma is so great that people um, have that much denial and depression around it. And I feel like as a society, that's disgusting of us. Yeah. If the stigma went away, I believe we would not have people dying of HIV. I mean, there's some people who, um, because of insecure housing, uh, it's really hard to carry your medications around with you and things like that. So homelessness also is another barrier. Yeah, I think, I, I don't, you're the expert here, but um, class and the stigma and just... Yeah, well, we know there's a very high rate of homelessness in Chicago amongst LGBT youth. Mm -hmm. So that plays into it as well. Do you think working in a major metropolitan area would be different than working in a small town or even a different country? Uh, Yeah, I've consulted with some people in small towns and, you know, they can count on one hand the population that they work with. They can Mm -hmm. give them very individualized care. Yeah, Chicago is probably much more in the door, out the door, you know, seeing more patients. But we really, really try to connect with those um, who we call our lost to care, our lost to follow up. Mm-hmm. We have people from the communities where a lot of our patients live, and uh, they will actually go to their home and say, "We're worried about you. You've missed a few appointments." And 
Try and bring them back in. How would someone get that job? As an outreach worker? Mm-hmm. Um, contact any HIV uh, provider. Um, Howard Brown, University of Illinois, the CORE Center. Um, so you work with the University of Illinois. Of, I do. At Chicago. I just want to clarify that. I mm-hmm. don't know if I said that in the beginning. Yeah. It's interesting to me because I think people tend to think you know it's 2018 and maybe there's a stigma around certain illnesses or disabilities but people aren't dying from it and i feel like this is saying like actually stigma this stigma specifically around hiv is killing people absolutely there's no doubt the stigma is killing people um there's also prep now one pill a day can prevent hiv uh, and it's amazing to me how few people know about it, even doctors that I've spoken to. Oh, yeah. Clueless doctors. Right. So I want to get into that. And I don't know how much you can say because I don't want to make you trash your coworkers. <laughs> but have you experienced amongst other doctors and other professionals, people who um, are maybe rude to patients or have prejudices or are just clueless? I think that a lot of people are uncomfortable talking about sex, even doctors, yeah. and they need to get more comfortable asking patients, what pronouns do you use? What are your sexual practices? Mm-hmm. Um, and that's something they're not teaching. Yeah. I have a story. I don't know if I've told you this. Um, a doctor asked me if there was any chance I could be pregnant. And I was like, no, there's, there's really not um, at all. And the doctor was like, well, are you sure? And I'm like, one, I am like tried and true lesbian. Um, Second of all, I'm on birth control and have been. And it was just this back and forth thing. And he ended up asking me, wait, so if you're gay, should I test you for HIV? And I was like, "Uh." I have never, and I've been working in this field for over 10 years. um, And I've spoken to other professionals and doctors about this. Never have ever seen any, even one reported case of HIV transmitted amongst lesbians. Cis lesbians. Yes, cis lesbians, Mm -hmm. yeah. It was, it was a very strange encounter and I cannot imagine um, maybe older doctors who had a more conservative time in medical school um, trying to work in this field. I just feel like there might be a really huge discrepancy between doctor and patient. Um, If they've been working in this field specifically in HIV and infectious diseases, you know, since the 80s, those are the ones actually who you want. (laughs) Um, They really, really uh, are very compassionate and really understand um, the patients they're working with and both from a stigma, mental health issue, and and physically as well. But it's the doctors who are really working in primary care who also take care of HIV patients that not so up to date. Not so experienced. So your husband, Mm -hmm. um, who's an infectious disease doctor, worked with HIV patients during the 80s, during the AIDS crisis. Yes. What was that? I mean, I know it's not you, but what was that like? Uh, you know, I know he didn't really, had no idea what he was getting into. Uh, he mm-hmm. went into infectious disease because he felt he can give people antibiotics and they got better and he wouldn't have to deal with people dying. And um, Not so much. Not so much. And uh, he'd open a clinic in the morning and wouldn't go home till the last person was seen, which was usually around 10 o'clock at night, um, really just trying to treat infections and keep people alive. But I think he developed really special relationships with his patients because you see them much more than other doctors more often more frequently and often you're the only one in their life who knows what they're struggling with got it um yeah i mean it's it's really a bit scary to think about you know i came out in middle school and one generation ago people were dying and the president wasn't acknowledging it and it was a shit show to put it lightly yeah, and uh, people are still dying, and um, unfortunately, you know, we need to really advocate for every penny we get for research and treatment. Is that hard? Because you're you're a state-funded institution, right? Yes. Is it hard to get funding? Yes. <laughs> it's very hard. Uh, it's um, There's just less money to go around. Mm-hmm. Do you think it's harder for you guys than other state-run institutions that are vying for funding? Uh, no, probably not. It's probably hard on everybody, but, um, that's good at least. Yeah. But there are discriminatory, right. But, but there are 
private organizations that are also trying to get the funding and, and you know, they have uh, private funds as well. So, Got it. Um, until Obamacare, the core center and our institution were the only two that treated people without insurance. Uh, we still treat undocumented That's without insurance. Um, so how many you know, how many clinics in Chicago treat people with HIV without insurance? Uh, I don't know. I don't know if any do besides we do because of this grant we have. It's called the Ryan White Grant. So you're the only one in the there city. There may be somebody of... else might have that grant. Um, the Core Center, the Core Center definitely does. Um, and uh, how many people live in Chicago? Yeah, right. No, seriously, I could. <sighs> what is it? A couple million. I feel like I'm going to regret saying this. And I wish I knew I'm going to be so wrong. Because I, uh... um, but it's a big city, I mean, and there's two places. That's. And again, Sigma, the core center, is known, uh, you know, it's a freestanding building that's known as, you know, HIV care. So, so just think... walking in there for people is difficult. So do you think it's easier because you're on a university campus for people? And our uh, other clinics are in. Um, right in the neighborhoods, in storefronts, without signs. Got it. So It's amazing how discreet you have to be for something that should not have a stigma at all. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and it's a double edge for us. We've been discreet for, you know, 20 years, and um, but then when you're trying to get funding, they're like, you do what? <laughs> mm -hmm. You see 1,200 patients and we haven't heard of you? So, but we purposely uh, try to stay under the radar. Do you think the stigma comes from the association of HIV with being gay, being in the queer community? Mm, yeah, probably. It probably does. I feel like there's so much there, just homophobia-wise, class-wise. Well, I mean, lack of education, again, people don't understand uh, that it's actually really hard to transmit. Um, people still believe that you can get it from eating off of somebody's plate. I hear those stories every day. Mm -hmm. Um and people are afraid. They're afraid to be treated differently. In the African-American community, they call it the package. Got it. So wow. um, the women are afraid. People will think they are sex workers. And It's interesting that there's also, I mean, you, I could do a whole nother episode about the stigma around sex work. I mean. Absolutely. There's stigma in within the stigma. True. So what, uh, we're almost running out of time. What do you want people to know? The, just the layperson, what do you want them to know about HIV? That we've come a long way, that undetectable means untransmittable, that you can have safe sex with somebody who's HIV positive. In fact, it actually, if you are having sex with somebody and you know their status and you know they're on medication and undetectable, you are probably safer having sex with them than somebody who doesn't know their status. How would someone get to an undetectable point? It's just about taking the medication. Got it. What about, um, let's say you have sex with someone and you wake up in the morning and you're like, oh shit, is there like an HIV morning after pill? Absolutely. There absolutely is. So contact your doctor or you can go to an ER. Got it. Yeah, I feel like there's just so little knowledge out there, but thank you for sharing, for talking about it, um, and for coming on my podcast. You're welcome. Thanks for helping to spread the anti-stigma word. Anytime. And I, we're like doing our closing, and I didn't ask the main question on my mind, which is, do you consider HIV a disability? Absolutely. There's yeah. no question about it. Um, you know, uh, it used to be where you can actually get disability income uh, with living with HIV. And, and now, now nobody can get disability right, exactly, income ever. Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. Um, but it's still, uh, the stigma is is so real um and uh even just to, people have to get off time from work you know regular but you know they're living with a chronic medical condition and mm -hmm. uh we know that that's like having a part-time job in itself managing medication managing oh, absolutely. doctors full-time job sometimes right. depending on how things are going exactly and it's interesting because i'm in a you know i feel like the chronic illness community really doesn't talk about it. It's very separate. You have the chronic illness community and then you have the HIV community mm -hmm. and they don't often over overlap, but I think they should. Even if it's what we say controlled, mm -hmm. it's still living with a chronic illness. Yeah. You know, you still have to go to the doctor more often. You have to take medication every day. And I feel, I mean, I'm guilty of this too, but I feel like the disability community really needs to talk about this. And I think the gay community 
the gay community does talk about it, but I think it's important to talk about it even more because this is our history. And yeah. Thank you. Anytime. So I'm sorry that I didn't ask that before. This is my like weird um, scattered thinking. Maybe I'll edit this. Maybe you'll just listen to this in a, in a weird, strange order. But on that note, I'm going to go. If you are listening on the podcast app, please consider leaving a review. It helps me out. If you're listening on YouTube, subscribe. And as always, take care of yourselves.